I have left myself at most 24 minutes to get started on learning and memory or the biology of learning and memory. When we are talking about learning and memory and how the brain basically learns, we have two main questions that we want to answer or that we need the answers to to understand this. One is what changes are occurring in a single cell during learning? So the changes in the in the pieces and the parts. And then the second question is, how do changed cells work together to produce adaptive behaviors? And this is really a question about um, the wiring. So the changes in the wiring and the changes in the connections between the cells. And we're gonna start with the pieces and parts and looking at what's happening in a single cell. Callot starts out this chapter on learning and memory by giving us a vignette of or an example of a patient who has damage to his temporal cortex due to encephalitis and he really asks you to put yourself into this same position and imagine yourself really um, waking up and realizing your consciousness and uh, feeling like you were just you just came from a dream state and um, then pretty soon you feel this sense of, oh, I have consciousness now, and the previous moment just slipped away, and it's again anew, as if you just woke up from this dream state. So I'm gonna write, I'm gonna read a bit of this of, um, uh, uh, so you write on a sheet of paper, just now for the first time, I have suddenly become conscious. And of course, you look at that a little bit later and you think, well, I wasn't conscious just then because I feel like I'm becoming conscious just now, and uh, out of this dream state so that was that was wrong and you uh, cross that out and you write now now I am conscious for the first time and of course you're gonna look at that a little bit later and say wait a minute that wasn't right because I'm just now conscious for the first time so you do that again and you cross it out and you write again now I know I am conscious for the first time uh, if this is hard to imagine this is actually what happened to this patient as uh, researchers came along and found um, this piece of paper that he had uh, consistently written about his consciousness and then crossed it out in a kind of angry fit. Uh, life without memory, it means no sense of existing across time. And this is really difficult to imagine for us. So I want you to, I'm going to leave a couple minutes uh, in off of this time of this, the slides today because I want you to stop and pause this and really think, how does a person without memory maintain a sense of self? Uh, who am I really if there's no sense of existence across time? So I hope you spent some time thinking about that and pausing that for just, for just a moment uh, because I'm, there's no answer to that. I usually just have students think about that for a while and talk about it for a little while. And the thing about talking about learning and memory is that learning and memory itself is, is really quite complicated. And so we have to do some descriptions of what we mean by learning and what we mean by memory. So I'm gonna start with this uh, really classical way of talking about learning in that it's called classical conditioning as discovered by Ivan Pavlov um, in the early, early 1900s. And I'm sure a lot of you have been introduced to classical conditioning and operant conditioning, and I'm going to do what I feel is necessary for them. And if you are a bit confused, you might go look up a bit, but I'm hoping I, I get the differences across at least as much as we need to. Classical conditioning is really examining reflexes, automatic, unlearned responses. Ivan Pavlov was originally interested in um, digestive processes of dogs. He was a physiologist, not a psychologist. And so if we look at what he was examining, which was salivation as part of the measure of digestive processes, this is a reflex. This is an automatic unlearned um, response if we are salivating to food or whatever he was putting in the dog's mouths. Sometimes it was um, something sour, sometimes it was um, uh, sand or something very not fun. But anyway, so 
what they, he originally was examining, um, what he was interested in was the unconditioned stimulus. And I'm going to use the stimulus of food because all of the uh, sour waters and sands and things are, are immaterial. And I'm going to call that an unconditioned stimulus uh, because it's unlearned. I don't have to learn to have some response to food as a dog. And the stimulus being the thing out in the environment, the food. That is going to cause an unconditioned response. Again, called unconditioned because I don't need to learn to have this response. And it's a response because it's me and my body and my behavior uh, is responding. But again, this is an automatic reflex. Um, when you put food in my mouth, I salivate. And that's what they found in the dogs, right? You put food in their mouths, you give them food, they salivate. What he discovered, though, was uh, classical conditioning, where if, uh, he paired a tone with the food. So originally, actually, what he found, different stories, but I'm just going to use one, uh, that the machine that released the food made a noise, click, click, and the dogs would start salivating to the noise of the machine. And so he started talking about this as an anticipatory reflex and um, started looking into basically what we now call classical conditioning. And he did use tones because you can manipulate the frequency of tone, uh, how high or low in pitch a tone is, and you can look at different tones. So the condition stimulus is the tone, which we are pairing with the food. Food. So we have a tone, boop, and then we get food. And originally the tone was a neutral stimulus. And that's an important piece of all of this classical conditioning is we're starting out with something that's a neutral stimulus and we have no response to. And we become it becomes a conditioned stimulus as we're going, it's we're talking about conditioning or learning as we learn to have some response. So we are pairing the food with the tone where the tone is followed by the food. And we do that several times. And what happens is that the tone becomes a conditioned stimulus. And now when the dogs hear the boop, just the tone, they have a response of salivating to the tone. And because they're salivating to the tone, that's called a conditioned response because it is a learned response. We learned the association between the tone and the food and that now we have a learned response or conditioned response, which is salivation. This is my basic slide that shows the metronome instead of a tone followed by food and the dog is salivating. That again is um, automatic as we uh, are getting the food. And then as we do this after a number of trials, a number of repetitions, now we can just give them the metronome and no food and we're gonna see salivation to the metronome. I will suggest that you go and watch the Pavlovian conditioning on the office. It's rather funny and it's very short as they keep trimming it and trying to make it so that it's not um, breaking copyright and that it can actually stay where it is. But it's a really great example of how um, really visceral and automatic and reflexive all of this is. So it's important to distinguish classical conditioning from instrumental conditioning, which is sometimes called operant conditioning. Uh, instrumental because we are more instrumental in our behavior and in um, volitional in getting the, the reward that we want. And operant conditioning, I'm pretty sure that comes from that we are people who are operating on our environment or even that the animals are operating on their environment. This it comes from um, Edward Thorndike's uh, original research with cats and his 1913 law of effect where he said responses followed by satisfaction will happen again. Those that are not followed by satisfaction will become less likely. And what we see is what he did was he put cats in these puzzle boxes and he um, put the food where they could see it and they would uh, perform a number of behaviors and if they figured out the behavior that opened the puzzle box in this example the cat just has to push on that lever and it opens the puzzle box but so, they, sometimes these were pretty complicated puzzle boxes where they had to um, hit something first and then push the lever or step on something first 
and then hit something. And what we see is this figure to the right where if we look at these as um, uh, errors or random moves uh, that happen before the crucial move that gets them out, that opens the puzzle box, that they are actually being reinforced for. So the response that's going to be followed by satisfaction, uh, we see fewer and fewer of those additional moves. They get faster and faster at just doing, just performing the mood, the, the, the move, the behavior, the response that gets followed by satisfaction. And of course, this was very, um, was examined very systematically and was uh, cleaned up quite a bit by B.F. Skinner. The way B.F. Skinner talked about this was in operant conditioning, responses are followed by reinforcement or punishment that either strengthen or weaken behavior respectively. Uh, so uh, if we look at the rat, which he worked a lot with uh, rats and pigeons really, uh, but if we look at the rat in this example, the rat goes off at the top one goes off to the left and finds a fruit loop. The fruit loop is going to be reinforcement. So reinforcers are events that increase the probability that that response will occur again. So now it becomes more likely that the rat will go off to the to the left. We'll take that left um, turn. Punishment includes events that decrease the probability that a response will occur again. So if the rat, if we take the bottom one, if we're looking at punishment and the rat goes off to the left and gets shocked, that's punishment decreasing that response. And so now the rat is more likely to take a right turn and to not go left. B.F. Skinner, I'm just saying, really rarely worked with punishment and was much more interested in reinforcement as guiding behavior. I usually do show this really short clip of the Big Bang Theory and Sheldon training Penny or uh, operantly conditioning Penny. And again, I'm going to go suggest that you that you watch that. I am including. So now I'm going to end a little over five minutes, 30 seconds early to give you guys time to think about the first question and to go watch these two short um, videos. And just to be clear, clearly not all learning fits cleanly into classical or operant conditioning, regardless of what B.F. Skinner and John Watson would want you to believe. That's simply not true. Um, one example in animals is the male songbird hears the song of his species over his first few months during this uh, critical period, and then he just is able to imitate that the following year. Uh, and we see this a great deal in animal languages. We see this in human language where we are learning the, the grammar of our language and we can say things that we have never heard before and certainly things that we've never been reinforced for um, before. So that's not how all learning works and we're just going to leave that there for now. I'm going to come back to that uh, much later in probably two or three sections maybe of um, learning and memory. Also importantly Usually conditioning works best when the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus are close in time and it takes several pairings. So usually we want this to be contiguous and we're seeing this kind of acquisition curve where we are learning that association between the tone and the food or whatever. But some conditioning works differently than that. And one example is taste aversion. So um, my um, unconditioned stimulus being my my illness, uh, but then I'm going to start now having a response of feeling ill to uh, just the the taste of food, the smell of food, sometimes the looks of food, and that illness comes oftentimes hours and hours after actually eating the food, and we see this kind of taste aversion where we don't want to especially smell or taste that food again but even sometimes look at that food again, um, that happens on one trial. So we see one trial learning and we don't have to have this multiple pairings. Ivan Pavlov believed that conditioning strengthened those connections between what he called the conditioned stimulus center and an unconditioned stimulus center in the brain. So that we had these particular regions of the brain that were representing those um, stimuli 
so and we were making connections between them as we were learning that association if that makes sense so that we had an area where we represented the unconditioned stimulus an area where we're representing the conditioned stimulus and as we're learning that association we're strengthening those connections and so one of the people who um, believed this and went in to look for um, those specific connections or what he ended up calling the engrams so physical representations of what had been learned so the specific connections of where we could see this learning occur um, with changes in brain activity was Carl Lashley and he set out to prove this by searching for these engrams in the cerebral cortex and he uh, made several cuts in the cerebral cortex looking for this engrams and, and uh, these engrams and I'm going to skip over some of the history here because it turns out this did not this was not in the cerebral cortex at all uh, we're going to look for this in a different part of the brain okay I'm looking at the timing of this and that I can only go to about 20 minutes and um, the next piece of this was this the modern search for the engram which is going to take enough time that I'm going to get way past that 20 minutes so I want to um, several times try to come back to our questions and see if we're really answering them we are not there yet but I wanted to I'm putting the questions up because I'm not actually sure we go in the specific order that uh, in this order and um, I have changed things around several times so but at the end we will come back to these questions again and it's a nice bridge of we do want to know what is um, what are the changes occurring in the single cells uh, when we're learning as well as what's the changes in the in the wiring of the cells or how they're behaving uh, together and again we will continue this on Wednesday starting with the um, modern search for the engram and then actually discussing several types of memory